No concept of an educated black class. They, they never met educated blacks. They never, they didn't go to school with them. They barely went to university with them. It just didn't exist. And that was the big problem there. It was just, you know, when you have segregation that's so complete, there's, there's fear based on ignorance. Zimbabwe, or Rhodesia rather, as it was, the segregation wasn't nearly as hermetic because it was smaller and because it wasn't, it wasn't quite as, um, it wasn't quite as oppressive. Um, and one of the main things, I mean, the thing that I think saved me, for example, growing up in, in Rhodesia was that I went to multiracial schools all my life, church, church schools, which were in every other way Dickensian and awful, and you got beaten all the time and whatever, but, but in one crucial way were very progressive, which was that they were multiracial. Um, and so when you get it, when you educate people, when you put kids together and just educate them together, you know, they, they, they get to know each other. Um, and that didn't exist in South Africa. I think that um, the race thing can become um, a sort of irrelevance quite quickly. I mean, the, in, in South Africa, for example, you know, what you see is not what you get. So you look at the ANC and you think, here's the ANC, it's a strident liberation party and whatever. And actually it's not at all. It's made you know, all sorts of deals with, with, with big capital, you know, the private sector and whatever. And it's quite a kind of, if you look at what it's actually done, it's somewhat conservative in many respects. And what they're trying to do in South Africa is this thing called black economic empowerment, where they've tried to move, you know, move resources across. And of course, it's been, it's very easy to get around it and to, 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 to pay off people and things. And that's been, that has been a problem, a problem in South Africa. I, personally, I think that, you know, there are so few whites left in Zimbabwe, and there are probably somewhere between 10 and 20,000 whites left in Zimbabwe, that it's sort of completely irrelevant. And in South Africa... But, but, but do you think Mugabe needs those whites there? Yeah, and he's, you know, I mean, I remember thinking to some extent when he's... I mean, if you saw the, the headlines in the, in the government-supporting newspaper, the Herald, um, and talking about whites and things, it was getting very... I mean, it looked incredibly dangerous. In fact, you know, the fact when the, when the white farms were taken over, very few white farmers were killed. I mean, you know, a dozen or twenty or something over that sort of first year or two. But it 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 sort of reminded me in its tone. I mean, it's sort of the way that Jews in in, in Europe had always been insecure because they. You know, especially in countries where they were doing well, in Germany and places, that they were a small, um, identifiable, you know, that they, they were interlopers, they'd come from somewhere else. And at times of economic depression, at times when, you know, you had a populist leader who wanted, they were easy to focus on as a thing. And so there was, there was that. But I don't, I mean, I think, you know, having said that, being a, even though I'm a white African, I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think white Africans have had a terrible deal. I mean, the by and large, they sort of, in South Africa, you go, they're still, they're still you know, swimming pools and large lawns, and, you know, and they're doing pretty fine, by and large. In fact, I wanted to quote, uh, I, think, I think it was from the PR, or I'm not sure it was from uh, this book, um, about the, what it means to be a white African. And, and you, you, you're at an airport or something, and you're reading about a farm killing in the newspaper, and there's a Congolese businessman who's sitting next to you trying to look and see what you're reading and uh, quote him. You say, and you see in his eyes an expression that you not recognize at first. And then you realize it's pity. It's for the farmer, for you and your little tribe of white Africans. And you write, I feel embarrassed, humiliated, mortified. I'm not used to being the one being pity. I am the one who pities others. And I think that, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. And I think it's still one of the big problems that the West, and especially Western countries that have a history of colonialism, that they have in the way that they deal with the developing world and with countries that were previously colonies. In that, I think that we are used to being, to having starring roles on the stage. And it's to the point that we almost don't mind if we're, the heroes or the villains, as long as we have a starring role. Well, the, what we don't want to be is just to be relegated to some sort of bit part. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's this kind of hubris, of, it's the pomposity of, of kind of thinking that we can, you know, invade this country and 
fix this and do that or whatever. And you know, it's difficult to realize that actually, you know, for the West to sort of change its, its, its whole historical attitude to, to the rest of the world and realize that you know, we don't necessarily play a starring role in other countries' melodramas. And, and, and there was a phrase that you used to describe what which I had not learned until I read your book was about how white Africa or the were it, what they were called in South Africa. So, yeah, so I mean, so well, <laughs> I mean, you know, a, a lot of what, a lot of what, it's strange, you know, writing. I mean, I grew up in mostly in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and whatever, but principally in Zimbabwe, and I've written this trilogy of accidental trilogy of memoirs, um, which is ostensibly cited mostly in Zimbabwe, a small landlocked country that is of no strategic importance and etc. etc. But really what one's mining these situations for universals. They're not really just about the sort of you know they're not really about politics of the place. They're about the idea of home and identity and belonging and all of these sort of universal resonances that we all have, whether we live in, you know, whether we cite them in rural Pennsylvania, like Updike, or you know, anywhere at all. You're not really writing just about these places. And I always have this sort of sense when I'm writing a book that I've got two, two, these two disparate readers on, on, on either end of the spectrum. And the one reader is someone who literally doesn't know where Zimbabwe is, and frankly, couldn't care less. And the other one is someone who knows an awful lot about it and thinks they know everything about it. So how do you write in such a way as to engage both of these readers without boring one rigid or confusing and bewildering the other one. What, how do you do it? And the, the, the kind of irony, the, the anomaly, was a, was a paradox of it, is that you would imagine that you write about it by sort of pulling back and sort of generalizing, but actually the, the, the truth is in the detail, the universal is in the specific. So you sort of you go in deep to actually to, 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 to pull back. And so, and I feel like if you, can, if you can describe something well enough, then the person who doesn't know about it, you paint a vivid enough word picture that they appreciate it. And the person who does know about it gets the thrill of recognition that, that they, it, it, and you know what it's like when someone writes about something you know intimately and they get it right. It's a wonderful thing. And it also, you know, on, a, on, a, on a meta level, it's, it's about not being alone you realize that someone else has thought this, has been in this position, has seen this and whatever. So the strange thing in terms of, of um, home and belonging and identity and whatever, but you know, I, I remember when my first book came out, Time magazine wrote a somewhat favorable review of it, but it had a picture of me looking, and it was a, sort of not a proper picture, and it made me look eyelided and, and whatever, and underneath it said, um, it said, um, Peter Godwin dash white African dash oxymoron question mark. Okay, so, I mean, and so in a sense, this is what, you know, I think what the reason I've ended up being a writer, and I, I, I tended to notice that a lot of memoirists in particular, uh, um, they only really start writing about a place when they are removed from it, either in time or in place. They either physically move away or, you know, 20 years us and the place they're writing about has changed completely. That you sort of need that removed to get your focal length on it. And um, growing up white in Africa was the most bizarre experience in a way. And you didn't, I didn't necessarily recognize it at the time at all. But I mean, we grew up in a rural area. I grew up speaking the local languages mostly. Um, and we would send each other Christmas cards with sort of robins and holly and snowmen and stuff we'd never seen, you know. And, and so we had this sort of notional kind of, this notional culture that was completely, you know, it was midsummer during our Christmas. Um, and um, the, anyway, the other big difference between the, the white population in Zimbabwe and the white population in South Africa was the white population in Zimbabwe was, was primarily, you know, overwhelmingly English speaking. And mostly from England originally. Whereas um, in South Africa there was a big Afrikaans population and they used to call us the Anglo the Anglo Africans, they had a nickname for us which was they used to call us an Afrikaans soaked peel. And it, the the translation for soaked peel is um, soaked is salt and peel is penis. So they would call us salt penises. 
and they would call us salt penises because they would say we had one foot in Africa and one foot in Europe and our penis was dangling in the ocean brine. <laughs> so when you were, um, at what point did you get uh, declared an enemy of the state? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I, so I had a, my, my mother was a doctor and um, my father was uh, an engineer and in this, uh, in, in the first book I wrote, Makiwa, um, was a sort of coming of age memoir. And it was all about, my, my mother was the only doctor in more than a thousand square miles. She ran leper colonies and tuberculosis sanitarium and mass vaccinations. And she did all the first, you know, all the family planning work and et cetera, et cetera. And I would go out with her on, on all the work and help her translate and things. And it was an amazing sort of upbringing. And then I went to these church schools boarding schools. And what happened in white liberal families was that because there was conscription, because the war started in sort of late 1972 and slowly got more and more intense at the liberation war. Um, and all white males were conscripted, but you could get, um, you were allowed to do university first. If you, so we would all, like white liberal families, would send their sons to university overseas and then we wouldn't come back. And that was sort of how it was done. And in the year that I finished my A-levels, finished sixth form and was about to go to Cambridge, they changed the law. And so I was I ended up in the in the army in the war for, two, for nearly two years, all in all. And then I went to university and I eventually came back um, uh, and I drifted into journalism. And I was one of the people who came back after 1980. And we were all very enthusiastic about what Zimbabwe could be. It could be this multiracial experiment. It could be this extraordinary place. And bear in mind that Zimbabwe, you know, for the first ten years after independence, it had it had the highest um, li literacy rate in Africa, well up in the 90s. The most educated population at the highest um, standard of living, had the best infrastructure. This extraordinary place that that you know shattered all of your stereotypes, you know, one stereotypes about about, about Africa. But very early on, and much, you know, and, and, and again, this is about how one trades in narratives that um, tend to be sort of not quite true. And the narrative, for example, with Mugabe, if you ask the average people overseas, you know, what, what, what happened in Zimbabwe, what went wrong, they'd say, oh, well, Mugabe comes in in 1980, and everything goes swimmingly for about 20 years, and then sort of 1990, 2000 years, a sudden rush of blood to the head, his, his first wife dies, he marries, new avaricious wife who are much, much younger, with whom he's already had two children, and um, they... Uh, husband he posted off to China. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, uh, it's, I don't know, Jahangir or somebody. Right. And, um, and they, they, you know, she, they called her the Imelda Marcos of Africa and all that, and she's, you know, she, and the, at that point, it all goes wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's, a, that's a, an appealingly simple narrative that one can immediately understand. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work because the Mass Wheeler massacres were in 84 and yet nothing happened. So, you know, these troops go down, they kill huge numbers of people, and we wrote about it. You know, various of us were there and wrote about it, and nothing happened. Not just in Zimbabwe, nothing happened in the UN, nothing happened from Britain. There were no, you know, aid wasn't cut, there was nothing at all. After the Mass Wheeler massacres, Mugabe gets given a, a knighthood. And, Honorary degrees. He, he got an Nehru award, award here. But it's like he said, but everybody just ignores this little thing that happens. And, and then, and then, it's only after 2000 that he goes off to white farms and things that he becomes the villain we all love to hate. You know, this is you know years after what. You know, so for me, I go back in 1980, and I've to some extent drunk the Kool Aid. So for me, this is. I've now been given a chance. I've been, you know, in, I, I've been conscripted into the war. I've fought on the wrong side of the losing war. I was, I was, you know, a remnant of colonial oppressors. But and now I'm getting a chance to sort of reinvent myself and to go back and you know, to go back to this, which I do. And it's all great. And then in '84, I see this. You know, I go down and see what's happening, um, and I can't unsee it. And so for me, that was. Mugabe's original sin, that was the sort of the thing, you know, that, it's, and also you start to get an insight then into, into what the regime is really like, um, and, and, and the reason nothing happens, if you look back on it, up until 1990 when the Berlin Wall falls and um, the Cold War ends, the West doesn't 
give a shit about how democratic or transparent Africa is. All they care about, and, so, and the East too, in Moscow and Washington, all they care about is do you support, you know, do you support Moscow or do you support Washington? And in the West, we're happy to support, you know, Mobutu and Zaire, one of the most corrupt leaders ever. We, you know, and, and Russia did the same, and there were certain leaders like Syed Barre in Somalia who, who went from one to the other, you know, getting, getting aid from one to the other. So, so, you know, we've got this whole legacy, the international system, that, you know, the whole of, if you think, Africa starts becoming independent, 1957 with Ghana, it's the first one, and then very, very quickly through the late 50s and, and early to mid 60s, the rest of them go, and then these final, final ones, the Portuguese colonies, and then Zimbabwe. But all of them, all of them, apart from South Africa, become independent during the Cold War, and it's a terrible time to become independent because you know the reason there are so many dictators is because nobody cares about it, and so. South Africa, the, if there's one big advantage that South Africa got from becoming democratic so late, it's that it's the first African country to become independent and democratic post Cold War. So, what was it like for you uh, to be living in uh, in New York or somewhere, and your you know your parents are still there in Zimbabwe, aging? Um, growing frail in a country that feels like it's getting increasingly hostile and unaffordable in many ways. And you keep looking for ways to come to the continent on reporting trips and stuff. So you're trying to, you know, you're getting this gig to do a reporting, uh, report on luxury vacations in South Africa or adventure tourism in the Victoria Falls or whatever, and you're actually coming to see a country in shambles and parents that you're going to have to leave behind at the end of the trip. Yes, I mean, in, in those terms, you know, what, I'm, what I was facing is what so many people face, which is, you know, what happens when parents become elderly and how you, what, how you deal with that situation and how, you, how they cope and, you know, the, when you become a sandwich generation, when you've got kids of your own and your parents are becoming frail and elderly. And instead of you know my parents being in kind of a condo in Florida, they were they were in a failed state in Africa and refused not only refusing to leave, which they adamantly did, um, but you know their their own the economic underpinning of their own lives, which you know, had hitherto been very comfortable upper middle class lives, collapsed. And so in the middle, so I had written this earlier book, Makiwa, which sort of went up until sort of the early nineties, I suppose. And then um, I, went, I went back and I was writing, I started to write a book about the collapse of Zimbabwe because it was sort of so extraordinary. And in that book, for example, I mean, one of the metaphors for what happens to my parents is the swimming pool. So at the beginning of the book, my father, who's this very fastidious engineer, something like and my father, when I grew up, was this, um, you know, he would stride around the bush in a safari suit and a handlebar moustache, speaking in a kind of clipped, British military accent, with wearing desert boots, and um, uh, you know, was very sort of emotionally truculent, Victorian part of familias and whatever you couldn't get anywhere close to him. And that was my father, sort of you know, a human, a personal embodiment of colonialism, if you could ever find one. Um, and so, in the next book, I'm sort of describing what happens. That they moved from the from the most border area into the town by then, into the capital, in fact. And they live in the northern suburbs in a sort of, you know, two-acre property or whatever. And there's a swimming pool which my father has designed and built, and he's very sort of anal about keeping it very clean and it's all fantastic. And then on subsequent trips, you know, there's no there's no electricity, and then there's no running water, and then they can't get chlorine to keep it clean, and the, 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 the swimming pool deteriorates until you can't swim. And then they can't get food. So they start they start breeding fish, they plant reeds in the swimming pool, and they start breeding fish in it. And my father sort of sits there with a net trying to kind of get these fish up so that we can have dinner, you know. And it's just, it's sort of funny and yet sad all at the same time. And then by the end, we're using the swimming pool water to flush the toilets because there's no running water. And so it's a sort of metaphor through the swimming pool of what happens. And this, you know, imagine if this is happening to an upper middle class family, what is happening to people who have nothing, you know, I mean, which, and so the other kind of, the other sort of metaphor, if you like, is that they've, the, the, the house is on a relatively main road, and my parents have a fence, and, and, and 
growing over fences of huge sisal um, bushes, you know, these sharp serrated leaves, and bougainvillea, whatever, it's, it's a barrier that keeps the third world out, and they're on this side. And the final thing for them is that, one, that on the other side of this fence, there are hawkers, you know, peddlers, people selling little, you know, little rickety wooden things, selling to them, you know, and they, they can't get transport back to where they live, to the township, so they sleep there at night. So you lie in your bed in the, in the big house, and you know, 15 yards away, you can hear the kids coughing and mewling and whatever, they're right there. And then one day, the, in winter, they've got little fires to keep themselves warm. One of the fire um, catches into the hedge, and the whole thing burns down. And my parents used to have early morning tea up at the pergola, and we go there the next morning, having failed to build a fire up, and we're having our little tea there, and then all the all the, all the um, all these impoverished people, the peddlers, things are all standing at the non fence, just staring at my parents. And suddenly, these two worlds have just you know, collided. And 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 it was, you know, and my and, and there's a, a scene in it where my mother eventually you know, takes the tea, and it's this sort of extraordinary moment where all of these people have all just sunk together, and in it, they found their common humanity. You know, I, I wanted to open it up uh, for questions, but one thing that struck me while reading the book is, as you say, the last couple of elections have obviously been rigged. You know, the